So uh, I have two questions, one for Mr. Bradley. Did any of your workers experience any health effects? Um, by the way, you said they had no respirators. Did, did you find any of them started having chronic illness or any problems? So the two biggest complaints that we, that I've, you know, this is not a scientific survey or study, but just anecdotally in talking with participants in the old school cleanup was, yes, there was respiratory, there was prolonged respiratory, they're still having respiratory increased sinus infection type issues, and the other big uh, health impact was skin rashes that we saw, so respiratory and skin rashes were too big. And thank you for talking about the the T aspect and the seven days a week and not the uncertainty of where your income was coming from and all that. That helps us as far as planning to be able to be prepared to address those things. And then may I call your, um, with the monies that are, are now still kind of, I don't want to say tripling in, but I know BP is trying to give money to the states and different things. Do the coastal communities have, have any say on how those are dispersed? I had heard a lot of rumors that there was controversy with going to Montgomery and no one knew if it was coming down to us. Well, uh, no one has asked me lately how to, how to spend it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting on that call. But uh, there are a lot of different so-called buckets of funding, so it gets very broad, and, and a lot of the funding is, uh, has, is for certain designated uses. Uh, and so I'm not sure, I mean, the island is uh, at the table and has been, uh, will be allocated some funding for various things. Economic development uh, is one, or to, to make sure that the economy is, continues to be robust as part of the recovery. Uh, we're also uh, involved with getting funding for uh, some acquisitions that would be for protection of critical habitats, uh, things of that nature, and also are, are likely to get some funding for uh, some of the, what's called NERDA money, which is to connect people with the, with the resources. So. Us in particular, again, as you heard me say earlier, we, we are on the front line, and so I said from the beginning, you know, it would be criminal if those areas that were that took it on the chin uh, were left out in, in the process of, of funding. And it, fortunately, right now, it looks like that at least off an island will be participating in that. Uh, if you were talking about uh, maybe funding that might could be that might could be helpful to be prepared for the next storm, that is not something that. That I, I know, excuse me, the next bill. Uh, that's not something that I've been involved with, but I do know that there have been folks looking at that, of maybe utilizing some of that money to be better prepared the next time. Thank you. Uh, Roland Hanks from University of South Alabama. Um, I'm just interested in something you mentioned, Mayor, about uh, people not evacuating when, when they need to. I wonder what kind of role. Uh, some of the technology for staying might have? I mean, do more people have generators? Are they getting their own warnings or whatever? I mean, what, what's going on with the, I, are they just Alabama stubborn? Or what, <laughs> well, what some of the folks that are staying are not originally from Alabama. Oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I really think a lot of it, is, well, you know, I know the media a lot of times, particularly the weather folks, they sometimes are accused of over-hyping, yes. uh, over-exaggerating, and that, folks have sort of gotten complacent. I think that's one, and I'm not suggesting that's they do that, but you know, we see in here. And, uh, but I really believe that in our case, a big part of it is what I touched on. It's the fact that they know if they go off the island, there's a good chance they won't be able to get back on in the timely fashion that, that suits them. And so they just say, well, I'll probably be okay. I mean, case in point, in Hurricane Katrina, we had a, a lady that was living by herself that was uh, pushing 90 years old, and she stayed at her home by herself during Hurricane Katrina. Fortunately, it worked out for her, but in situations like that, it's not just about the storm that you have to be worried about. It's your own, per if something would have happened to her physically outside of the storm, she could not have gotten the help that she would have needed. And so you're putting yourself in a bad position, and you're also putting potentially those individuals that may have to respond in a bad position too. So I don't really know what the answer is, but those are that's my best guess. Mayor, um, when you were talking a bit about uh, after the oil spill, you said that some people in the community felt like they were sort of put in a bystander role. Mm -hmm. 
And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe from conversations you had or, or ideas that have come up after, what do you think may have, um, have helped to allow community members to feel like they were more active? Well, I think part of it is that, as Brian mentioned, you know, this certain type of training that goes into responding to an oil spill. And, and so, again, I was not being derogatory necessarily, but the fact that me as a mayor, you know, I didn't have any training for oil spill. I was willing to roll up my sleeves and get out there and help if I could. But it, I think it was more from a, from a training and these people were sent in to do a job. And again, it was essentially, they didn't say it, but it was like, okay, y'all just stay back. We got this kind of a thing. And uh, I guess, again, that just kind of goes against our grain with folks that live certainly here in the South. You know, we want to be part of the solution. And so I, I would think, as I touched on a little uh, earlier there, is let's go ahead and continue the, the outreach and the education and the training so that if something were to happen again, we do have local, regular people on the ground who can more readily spring into action and be and be helpful. And as I mentioned also, just like again with the BOO program, and I don't know if that was the case all around, but I know the, the people that I spoke with that was very familiar with our waterways were very um, turned off by it that they were just sort of pushed aside. It's like, you know, we're here to take care of this and, and when again the local knowledge I feel would have been tremendously helpful to those individuals who were here to help to un better understand the local waterways and I think there's a, a connecting of the dots that, that can be done better going forward. Uh, Shun Leo from uh, University of South Alabama. How do you bridge uh, that communication gap? I mean there is a sense from all three of you that there is a pecking order of whose knowledge is more important, whose knowledge is more scientific or valid, but the people with the boots on the ground or, you know, boats in, in the water have that knowledge that outsiders or scientists don't acknowledge as useful. So how do we bridge that? And, and I don't know the exact answer other than I think that any time you can draw from local knowledge it's going to be an advantage and mm -hmm. I realize when you're responding to an emergency sometimes you don't have the luxury of time so to me there would have to be something that would have to be happening now versus then and and how exactly you do that I, I don't know that I've got that figured out right now but I think the the end result of the recovery would benefit from that type of shared information. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just add that there's been a lot of nonprofit community groups that have sprung up and have strengthened and have organized post BP that are positioned to serve as that liaison between the community and the decision makers to help you know, guide the needs of the community and interact with those uh, decision makers. I think we're probably in a lot better position today to respond to something like this. And that, and that was one. Oh, no. I was going to say, um, one of the things I didn't say, the last stuff I didn't say over here, but I think one of the best things we can do, and I think she sort of touched on that, is we, we better learn from this experience. You know, we need to really uh, get our arms around what transpired, what went right, what went wrong, what can be done better, and really, you know, hone in on that because you know, we hope it doesn't happen again. But if it does, we as a people and as a nation are hopefully be more uh, readily uh, able to respond in, in, a, in a better way. Yeah, so I would add to that, I think they're absolutely right in that the time is now outside of the emergency situation. Uh, and uh, it could be through trainings, it could be developing or, or building on the amazing um, growth that's occurred uh, in many NGOs uh, or other community groups. Um, I would add to that uh, some focus on changing policy or regulations uh, during the, um, the emergency itself. So the, you know, the incident command structure is very clear and it's there for a reason because you do need efficiency uh, and you need certain processes to happen without a lot of community discussion. But there is room in there somehow to change or to introduce some 
roles for the people with the local knowledge uh, and their relationships. And I'm not sure who or where or how that change might occur, but I think that now is the time to be looking at uh, the, the rules and the regs that, um, that are there for a reason to see where there is capacity to formally not only just encourage but actually permit those uh, different stakeholder perspectives to be um, available at the time of the crisis. Yeah, well, I agree with you, Dr. Finney Kane. I've been trained in the Incident Command System for a number of years. And it, a lot has to do with the scope of the incident. And remember, the command system was set up for, might have been a, a gas leak in, a, in a, a town or so. These offshore remote, you know, they, this is something unique, a deep water incident like this. So it was, half, I was in the midst of it, it was haphazard, no doubt. And um, definitely it can be incorporated, you know, for large scope activity to have people both involved. I just I have a question for Ryan. I was involved with the, the vessels also, but I was part of the nerve response sampling, and and I found it very interesting that there wasn't a lot of information exchanged. I mean, we would meet in the morning at in Cotton Bay at one of the marinas at 5 a.m., but it was more of a safety briefing. They never really told us where the oil was. I mean, we could look on our computer and you know trying to you know figure it out. But I mean, there just wasn't a lot of information about that, and I, I just didn't know if it was just in the Orange Beach area, or was it, it, it was it was also your case in Mississippi? So, so you're saying on the vessel of opportunity, during the vessel of opportunity? The, the, oper the people that were operating the boats weren't very, we weren't, they weren't getting a lot of information. Yeah, well that's the thing, as I was uh, I explained, we were providing a lot of information, what we were seeing in observations, and mm -hmm. latitude, yeah. longitude, and we didn't receive another word back. Not a good, hey, you're doing a good job, you're not doing a good job, Nothing. We just kept uh, reporting, uh, but uh, you know it was uh, just like you said. We would have a safety meeting in the morning. The day would usually end around three, four o'clock, and uh, you know whatever they were doing nighttime ops. We didn't know what they were. We didn't know what was going on. We would. I know that when we were coming in, there was other vessels, other contractors going out. And we didn't know what they were doing. I don't know if they were responding to the, the accordance that we were, were issuing or what. We didn't get that information. So that would be and, and a lot of misinformation like people, the operators would say, well, my neighbor said he heard a plane last night and somebody was playing, spraying dispersants from the airplane. I said, no, I don't think that's right. They're not doing that. And they said, well, I, that's what she said. And I'm like, no, that, that's not right. But nobody would ever say, it was wrong or wasn't wrong. There was there was allegations of you know you could smell the dispersant. You could people were sprayed with the dispersant. There was allegations of dispersant was being sprayed from vessels uh, in shore. Uh, I've asked about followed up with it and they don't admit to that occurring. You know we don't know. Yeah. So. Um, follow up for Ryan, did you ever go back to a site where you had reported something and find that it had been taken care of? Yeah, I, I mean, it was hard to say. For example, a lot of times we'd call in boom that was damaged and they would get out pretty quickly. They had specialized teams that did nothing but fix boom. They would get out there pretty quickly and fix that. I feel pretty confident that we had seen instances where we reported oil where it looked like it had been treated with dispersal in one way or another. Uh, you, you know, there was not supposed to be dispersal sprayed in state waters, but that was three miles out. What's to say you can't spray it in four miles out? And the tide and the wind within that same day brings that dispersal or a mix in shore. And that's what I believe I saw. We can't confirm that. Of course, they deny any of that. But. So I'm curious, you're very diplomatic in how you describe <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, at the end of the day, um, would you say your 
understanding and or trust um, changed with respect to BP and with respect to federal government agencies? Or did you come out as confused? Well, you know, I have no doubt in my mind that there is some, you know, there is some cover-ups that take place. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that that occurs. There's, you know, information, things that happen that you really don't want getting out to the public. And, uh, I, you know, I don't point fingers at anybody, but I'm sure that, that those type of instances occur. Uh, you know, I believe everybody did was all in to, to do a good job and to, to actually make a difference and clean up the spill, there's no doubt, but, you know, there's just things that you don't want out of. And it was difficult from a seafood perspective, we would see things and, you know, we want people to eat this seafood one day. And so even as an industry, we were very cautious of what we put out into the public realm because we really showed you what we were really seeing, you know, nobody might not ever want to eat stuff again. Mm -hmm. Carl? Can I stick up for the federal government? You can. <laughs> nobody else is going to do it to you. <laughs> so, so you know, especially the user. There is what's called a pre-approval zone, if you're familiar with that. Okay, if you're not familiar, it's been around for a long time. So there's a pre-approval zone outside of state waters, it's, and you know what it is. Greater than three meters where you can use dispersions. Okay, so, so it didn't require anybody's permission, did it? It's already. For those of you that didn't see it, <clears throat> Mike Sands talked about it yesterday with the national response team and so on and so forth. So I see some people nodding their heads. So, so that's done. Florida's a little different. Uh, uh, they're nine miles on one side and three miles on the other side. But by and large, Mississippi and Alabama have pre approval greater than three miles <clears throat> and greater than three meters to use dispersants anytime. The federal on scene coordinator says that he wants to use it based on the team that musters up and they have a conference call and they decide it's okay from the stakeholder perspective. And the state has a dog in that fight, so all that was pre-approved, so I just want you to know that. Yeah, and I, I don't want to say that we know for certain that they were used within state waters, but, but like I said, it's really easy to spray it out in four miles where it's completely legal, and then the same day to win. I promise you that happened. Then. Okay, you're absolutely correct. So, the, you know, the there was no intentional spraying inside of state waters even though Mississippi recognizes three miles seaward of the barrier island, so you're way offshore in Mississippi. Right. That's great. I got a final question up front right here. Uh, Brian, did you ever feel that some of the work you were doing was busy work? Yeah, I mean, there was times, I mean, every day, you, you're on the clock seven days a week. There was bad weather days, there was rain, they wouldn't let you out if the weather was so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't want to say, hey, I'm not going to work today because you, you'd probably get fired and you'd be deactivated and lose your contract. So you stuck around, you hung around the docks. Uh, you know, during those days you would do scans of the harbors and whatnot. But uh, yeah, there was downtime. You know, you're working seven days a week, but there was downtime where you really weren't active and on the water you know, doing stuff. You know, I asked the question because, and this touches um, what uh, the mayor said, if we want to rebuild resilience and empower communities, uh, having people do busy work okay, isn't the way to do that, right? Uh, having people feel that they rolling up their sleeves and doing something productive is the way to well, his resilience. If, if it would have been a political disaster if they would have brought a ton of outside uh, help in to do this. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example of how strong the local community had. It wasn't just BP didn't want to do it for that, but the local community wouldn't allow anybody to come in. I know in Mississippi, certain places, they wouldn't allow it. I'll give you an example. One of the local fuel dock owners he was trying to get a couple of his boats on the vessel of opportunity. Well, he never got hired, never got eventually. He shut down his fuel dock, put the padlock on it, and said nobody's getting fuel. And there was major operations coming in and out of this, this harbor. He shut it down. The next day, his boats were on there. 
<laughs> so, uh, let, me, let me make one last comment. I know we probably have to go, but I couldn't, I couldn't see the gentleman that said it because it was behind the post. But I, I just want you to kind of know where I stand in all this. Um, anything that I've had to say today is not intended to be critical at all because I believe that what we were dealing with was a situation that we weren't prepared to deal with. It, it, was, it was an anomaly. It was one of those hopefully once in a lifetime kind of things that ever happens. There, there were resources thrown at it in a lot of different ways. Maybe in this gentleman, like this gentleman says, maybe a lot of those resources weren't utilized to the best. Uh, and there was a whole bunch of stuff going on behind the scenes. And it's one of those times I believe that you, you, don't, you, you don't want the people seeing the sausage being made and you certainly don't want to let anybody see and you sweat. So there was a lot of that going on behind the scenes. I respect that, you know, as an elected official. You know, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm hard-pressed to complain or, or point fingers is because I get that done to me all the time. But I, I don't think that's really uh, what we need to do here. I think we need to do a real thorough evaluation, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today, of what did, didn't happen. But more importantly, how can we improve on it the next time? I think that's what we need to do as, as, a, as a nation is, is, you know, come together and figure out what can we do that's going to be better next time and not be so concerned about pointing fingers at any one or the other because I believe, as Brian just said, I really believe that everybody was well intended uh, and, of course, we all know there, there, has, there was a road, a famous road that was built with good <laughs> intentions, but I do believe everybody was there for the right reasons and uh, you know we, 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 did, we did good in some things and not so good in others and it's those not so goods that we need to really focus on so that we can be better prepared the next time. Thank you for having me. Well thank you all. Very much.